you know, immediately because of who I am, because of what my company does, I immediately think of all the jokes. Okay, this is a this is a captive audience. We're gonna yes. we're gonna go out there and kill tonight. Yeah. How what how much dark humor runs through your work in prisons? <laughs> a lot. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever it is, wherever you are. Thanks for subscribing, streaming, or downloading and listening to us on your computer or MP3 player. I'm Austin Titchener, one-third of the Reduced Shakespeare Company, and you're listening to this week's Reduced Shakespeare Company podcast, number 346, Theater in Prison. Kate Powers is a New York-based theater director who recently directed Thornton Wilder's Our Town at the fabled Sing Sing Correctional Facility as part of her work with a program called Rehabilitation Through the Arts. Kate and I have only ever met via social media on Facebook and Twitter, but I read about her production online and was so impressed and and amused and, and moved by her stories that I was very grateful when she agreed to let me interview her for the podcast and talk about the the special challenges and rewards of creating theater in a maximum security prison. I asked Kate to start by giving me just a little bit of her background. Uh, my background is uh, very heavily in classical theater, uh, a lot of Shakespeare. My master's degree is in Shakespeare. Where'd you get your master's? From a place called the Shakespeare Institute in Stratford-upon-Avon. Oh, that little tiny place. That little place. Uh, I've been working with the guys uh, in the program at Sing Sing for about five years. Uh, our program is called Rehabilitation Through the Arts, mm. or oh. RTA. Um, and it was founded at Sing Sing about 17 years ago by a woman named Catherine Bokens and several men who were incarcerated there. Uh, and RTA is now uh, in five different facilities in New York State, five different prisons, two uh, what are called Max A. Um, so on the scale of um, maximum security, these are the even more secure. Okay. Uh, cool. So two Max A and then two medium security facilities for men and then uh, the prison for women at Bedford Hills. Wow. Well, and uh, you know, immediately because of who I am, because of what my company does, I immediately think of all the jokes. Okay, this is a this is a captive audience. We're gonna yes. we're gonna go out there and kill tonight. Yep. How what? How much dark humor runs through your work in prisons? <laughs> a lot. Um, the guys especially like it when I start picking up pieces of prison slang and quoting it back to them. Mm-hmm. I bet. Do you feel? Do you ever feel unsafe? You know, uh, that's what probably the, the question I get asked the most often about this work, um, Austin. And the answer is no. Um, the guys who are in my program uh, are so eager to be there, are so hungry to learn uh, that they're going to do everything they can to protect the integrity of that program. Uh, so, if anything were to go down in the facility while I were in there, I I know in my core that those guys are going to form a circle around me and take care of me. That's awesome. Well, and, 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 and this speaks to, I mean, this work speaks to what they say prisons are supposed to be about is rehabilitation. Yeah. There's not actually a lot of rehabilitation going on in most of America's prisons. So, um, when it, when it does start to happen, it's pretty exciting to see. Our program is not about training these guys to be actors. Right. Our program is about giving them life skills. Right. Um, and so the really important thing about it is certainly the issues that we explore uh, through the plays that we do. But, it, you know, it teaches them doing doing this work with them. Uh, they learn uh, they, their communication skills improve. Right. Uh, they their critical thinking skills improve their reading skills in some cases improve um, their idea of how hard they have to work to achieve a goal changes, right? That sense of delayed gratification because you can't put a play up in a couple days, you right, know? Right, right. Um, so they learn all of those things. Uh, and they really learn uh, what trust is. Because for many of the men, they've had very little experience of that in their lives. But you cannot put on a play without trusting that your collaborators are going to do what they said they were going to do at more or less the time they said they were going to do it. Um, and uh, so that's really the goal. It's, you know, they, of course, they enjoy putting the plays up and they enjoy the notoriety that they get within the facility when those things happen. But, um, but the goal is to give them life skills so that they are better positioned to um, participate in the larger society when they come home. Well, and that's as good an argument for the value of the arts for anybody, not just prisoners that I've heard. Yeah. 
Yeah. So talk about this production specifically. I mean, these are both, these are two sort of mythic things clashing. I mean, Our Town is a sort of a fundamental work, you know, and, yeah. and, 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 and Sing Sing, the prison, is, is sort of fabled in the culture as well from a, on a right. completely different end of the spectrum. Uh, yeah. What was, how did you choose the play? Did they choose it? Start with, start with that. Sure. So uh, the, we, we have a steering committee in place in each of the prisons where we work, uh, which is comprised of anywhere from five to seven guys who are part of the program. And we're trying uh, with the steering committee to model leadership skills for the men. So they tell us uh, what kind of workshops they want us to teach. Uh, they come up with what they consider to be sort of the guidelines for men to participate in the program. They administer discipline within the group, right, if they feel like a guy's not pulling his weight or if he's you know, not attending enough things. It's, they're the ones who are going to handle that, those kinds of things. Uh, and the steering committee also picks the plays every year. Um, at Sing Sing, we do um, one major production every spring. Um, and uh, the other facilities do two shows every year or maybe every year and a half, right? But Sing Sing is considered in part because of what you said, because it's got a weird kind of sex appeal about it because it's so notorious. Right. Um, right that uh, it's sort of the flagship production for um, rehabilitation through the arts. Um, so the guys pick, but you know, uh, they're learning leadership skills. They haven't necessarily mastered them, <laughs> Austin. Right. So it's a, it's a hot, sloppy process sometimes. And, um, because you, know, you have five guys who are reading the play, right? But they're all busy. You can't believe how busy they are. You think, oh, captive audience, right? Like they've got nowhere else to be but doing this. They, the, our guys are involved in so many things. A lot of them are in college. Or in the pre-college program, um, so they're really busy. So, so what will happen is we'll we'll have a, a title, right? And you'll get them several copies of the script, and two of the five guys on the steering committee will read that play, and those two guys don't like it. Mm. And then the other three guys are like, oh well, they didn't like it, so I won't read it either. So then a play gets eliminated based on a minority vote, right? The yeah. other three might have all read it, loved it, but they never even got to it. And so you have various permutations that happen over and over again. Um, and so, so we sometimes burn through a lot of plays really mm. quick. And then it's like, Hey, hang on a minute, guys. Can we go back? Because you threw this one overboard and, you know, so they, they had, um, a lot of trouble. This, this was a particularly challenging year to pick a script. Um, and, uh, they finally came down to, we're going to do 12 angry men. Mm. And I said, well, okay, but do we have 12 guys who are prepared to be at every single rehearsal? Because all 12 of those jurors are on stage all the time. There's no scene between juror three and juror six that lasts more than three or four lines. So you can't break it up, you know? Right. And they came back and they said, well, actually, we're not sure if we have 12 guys who can really carry it. Um, and they had also done 12 Angry Men several years ago. And I said, I don't really think we should be doing repeats. I think we should be challenging ourselves to grow and to explore or new territory. You know, and Sing Sing is a max. So my guy, a lot of my guys are doing anywhere from 20 to 25 years to life. So population doesn't turn over that much. Why are we doing a play that, a, you know, a huge percentage of our audience has already seen? Right. right? Oh, wow. I, it's fun. Yeah, it's funny to think about prison shows in terms of outreach and de audience demographic and all that yeah. other thing. But you're right. Yeah. I mean, we always want to pick a play that's got some kind of message that we want to share with the audience. Um, two years ago, I directed... Um, Tracy Letts' Superior Donuts at okay. Sing Sing. And we were lucky enough to, uh, Michael Keen, McKean came up and um, spoke with the men one night for a couple hours and sort of talked to them actor to actor about working on Tracy's play. Wow. Which was great. Wow. I stalked, I stalked Michael on Twitter until he uh, decided to go to prison. <laughs> Twitter is a very useful stalking tool, isn't it? <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah, I highly recommend it. So, uh, how, so how did you come to choose our town? Did you recommend right. it? Did one of the guys? Well, I said to them, so they, so they said, okay, we, we're not going to do 12 Angry Men. And, and they had one play that was written by a guy who um, was at one time incarcerated at Sing Sing that they, again, that they had done once before. And so some of the guys were kind of lobbying for that. But honestly, Austin, they were lobbying for it just because it was late and we needed a play and right. they were a little under the gun, right? <laughs> right. And I said, again, you know, why are we doing a play we've already done before? And, you know, this play was written before we were offering a playwriting class. It's not so well written, even though it's an interesting philosophical idea. I think we should challenge ourselves to move forward. And I, so I went to the list of plays that we've been looking at. And I said, look, you threw a couple things overboard that I know not everybody read. I said, can we go back and take a look at those again? And one of them was uh, Tartuffe. Wow. 
by Moliere. Uh, and one of them was Our Town. And uh, two of my guys who are super smart guys, super thoughtful, um, have done so much work on themselves since they've been incarcerated, said about Our Town, they, they just were immediately negative on it. And they said, there's nothing happening in this play. This play is not about anything. Okay. And I said, and I was stunned because, as I say, these guys are really smart. And so I went back to them and I said, listen, do me a favor. I said, I'm not trying to shove this play down your throat. I said, but read it one more time. And I said, just notice how many times we talk about birth and death and the eternal and the stars. And I said, if you still think it's not about anything, then I won't mention it again. Um, and so I went away and came back a few days later. And when I came in a few days later, the entire steering committee said, we're doing our town. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and what a great thing to put on a poster for our town, birth, yeah. death, stars, the eternal. Yeah. Right. It is, but it is one of those deceptive plays that feels oh, old fashioned where nothing's going on and yet everything is going on. Well, and there was a lot of dissent. I mean, so as a steering committee, those five guys chose it and then we took it to the membership of our group and those guys were not happy Austin <laughs> they were not amused because they all sort of collectively said the same thing there's nothing going on in this play or they said various things such as um, this play is not about my town yeah. Uh, yeah this is a white play uh, or this play is boring right and so mm -hmm. along that spectrum and um, and so uh, one of the first things I did was I showed a documentary called OT which is about a group of kids at a high school in Compton uh, doing the first play that they'd done at that high school in more than 20 years. And they chose to do Our Town. And in the course of that documentary, the kids take this journey from that's a white play, that play has nothing to say to me, that play is not about Compton, uh, that play is boring, to every town is our town and Grover's Corners is so cool. Right. Um, and so I thought, cause I thought, well, I could talk to the guys for three weeks or I could show this documentary. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so we watched the documentary and that was really the beginning of them starting to say, huh? Okay. And then we did started to do table work. Um, and I threw open to them. I said, you know, we don't have to do this in period clothes. You know, we can, we can do whatever, whatever home feels like to you, whatever you imagine home to be. We can explore what that might look like in terms of the costuming and all that stuff. But I also brought them about 20 pages of images of African American and Native American people from circa 1900, 1910. And a lot of the guys said, I never knew black people dressed like this. Hmm. Um, and then they started to say, well, can we, can we wear those clothes? Can we dress like that? Wow. <laughs> and they, they are, they are sort of, um, and I don't, I mean this in the best possible way, but they're kind of like a bunch of 14 year old girls when it comes to the costumes every year. <laughs> Because they are mandated to wear the state green uniform all the time. Like when you bring in civilian clothing for them to wear, they get so excited about the clothes. Yeah. yeah. So when they started sort of campaigning for, can we wear the period clothes? I said, of course, you can. of course, if that's what you want to do, that's what we'll do. Um, and one of the guys who was the, one of the strongest uh, opponents to doing the play said to me last week before our dress rehearsal, he came over and he said, I just want you to know that I was wrong, that this play is so beautiful, and that you can coach my team anytime. <laughs> he also told the, uh, the outside, the actress that came in to play the role of Emily Webb, he said to her, we cannot continue to be friends if you keep making me cry like this because I have a reputation to uphold. <laughs> Hi, I'm Howard Sherman, noted theatrical pundit and raconteur, and you're listening to the Reduced Shakespeare Company podcast. Where can you RSC the RSC? Our London run at the Leicester Square Theatre has already been extended to August 17th, so catch us there if you can before we head back out on our fall UK tour. Then next month in August, we head back down to Australia for six weeks, performing The Bible, The Complete Word of God Abridged, in Melbourne, Adelaide, Canberra, Brisbane, and Sydney. And this fall of 2013, in addition to the UK and Australia, we'll bring Shakespeare Books, Christmas, and the new show, The Complete History of Comedy Abridged, to the US, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Sydney. 
Cincinnati Playhouse in the park. As always, the very best way to stay up to date about all of our worldwide performance dates is to sign up for the Reduced Reader, our email newsletter. Go to ReducedShakespeare.com and click on the link to subscribe and check out our touring page for a specific box office venue and ticket information. And now back to my conversation with Kate Powers, who talked about transforming Grover's Corners, New Hampshire, to a maximum security prison. I love the notion that what you said is our town is every town. Yeah. So it needn't be Grover Corners, New Hampshire in 1910. It could easily be the rec room at Sing Sing 2013. Exactly. And in, in certain ways, it, I mean, we, we ended up with a, a little bit of a hybrid in a way. I mean, we, we changed it to uh, Grover's Corners, New York. Mm-hmm. Um, and we changed all of the geographic references from, uh, you know, the town Conway and North Conway and Jaffrey and North Jaffrey, all that stuff. We changed all of that to things that you can see out the windows of Sing Sing. Oh, nice. Um, and we added, uh, you know, when, when the editor Webb comes out in Act 1 and says, you know, religiously we are 86% Protestant or whatever he says, uh, we actually did a survey in the prison and we changed it to reflect the demographics of the prison. That's so awful. it was, you know, it was like 46% Protestant and 20% Catholic and 25% Muslim. Yeah. Um, and we, we added when, when the stage manager says, oh, the congregational church is over here and the Baptists are down in the holla by the river, which is one of my favorite lines in all of dramatic literature. <laughs> Where else would you put the Baptist but down in the holla? By the Ob- river? Obviously, duh. Uh, duh. So we added the mosque mm. uh, to the list of things. And we and all of those things, uh, because we were in the visiting room at Sing Sing, we, we had him gesturing in the direction that those things are within the peculiar town of Sing Sing. Yeah. Um, one geographical oddity about Sing Sing that most people don't know is that it's the only maximum security prison in the country that has a major commuter railroad run right through the middle of it. Wow, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, the, the Metro North, the commuter train that comes out of Grand Central and goes up along the Hudson River to all of those sort of bedroom communities uh, that people commute from, uh, it goes right through the center of Sing Sing, right before you pull into the Ossining Station. Okay. Uh, all of a sudden, you'll see these huge gray walls on either sides of the train. And if you look up, you'll see the, the concertina wire at the top. Mm. Um, and the men, in order to travel from the cell block to the yard or from the cell block to the schoolhouse or indeed from the cell block to the visiting room, have to cross the train tracks uh, in these little tunnels Wow! that run up and down the hill. Right. So when the train goes by in, in our town, the train goes right by. Goes right by, yeah. Um, uh, can you talk, you wrote, a, you wrote a lovely essay about the particular staging challenges because you're in the visiting room at Sing Sing. Can, can, can you talk about what you wrote about there, about staging sure. that cemetery so, scene? So, um, you know, we, this year we were performing in the visiting room uh, at Sing Sing, which is about um, 50 or 60 feet wide and about 100 or 120 feet long. So it's just a big rectangle. Um, and, uh, the guys have never done a play in that space before. So I was excited to use it as kind of a teaching opportunity about how you can create a theater space anywhere. Um, and also to use a different configuration than they're used to. Normally they have a big proscenium arch auditorium that they do their plays in with terrible 1950s echoey cinder block acoustics and whatnot. Um, and so we decided to do a three quarter thrust, uh, for our town, uh, in the visiting room. And, um, we couldn't have any stage lighting in that space because uh, the lights in the visiting room literally, uh, Austin, never go off. Right. They're on or they're off, and nobody knows where the off switch is. Among you know several people that I spoke to on the staff of the facility, I said, if we wanted to turn them off, could we do that? And they said, no, we don't even know what to do. Um, and so, and also they said, you know, the, uh, the electrical fittings in that room wouldn't really be able to handle the demands of lighting equipment anyway. So, okay, we're doing universal lighting. That's fine with me. I do a lot of Shakespeare. I'm down with that. Um, And then, uh, so we can't take a blackout. And um, we are also not allowed uh, by the Department of Corrections to take an intermission. We need to, whatever play we do, we are doing it from start to finish, and we are moving that sucker along. It's not like you're selling drinks in intermission. No, certainly not. So um, the the bar service is terrible. (laughs) All right, so there's one drawback to working at the prison. Okay, got it. One. But anyway, so, so uh, the particular challenge that presents with our town uh, is how do you get from the wedding at the end of Act Two uh, and the character of Mrs. Soames, who in this production became very quickly Mr. Soames, 
uh, how do you get from Mr. Soam saying, uh, what a perfectly lovely wedding, I, I love for people to be happy, uh, and all of those chairs set up for the congregation at George and Emily's wedding to the cemetery. Because in every production of Our Town ever, you get to take an intermission there, and you clear the church, and you set up the cemetery, and then hopefully you have a blackout, and then you bring the lights up, and whoop, there are the dead people. Mm-hmm. So that was not available to us. Um, and so uh, one thing we have at Sing Sing uh, is we have a lot of bodies, right? Um, and uh, a lot of our guys, as I said, are in college. And so they weren't available to be in the play this year because uh, they couldn't make it to rehearsal very often because of their class schedule. Um, and so, But I went to those guys and I said, can I interest you in playing dead men? Hmm. Um, and uh, so we had about nine guys who said, yeah, I'll play a dead guy. And... Um, one of the things, so I wanted, you know, we'd have all our named characters that we followed through the play, right, in their period clothing. And then I would have these nine guys who would be in their state greens, right, because in a lot of prisons in this country, we, uh, they still, uh, if a guy dies while he's in prison and the family doesn't claim the body, he's buried in a potter's field and he doesn't even get his name on his grave. He just gets his prisoner ID number. Um, so those, those men are like permanently and forever disappeared, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, and, and also, as a country, we kind of do that with the people we incarcerate. You know, we have this kind of lock them up and throw away the key and forget about them. Now that problem is solved, kind of collective vibe about it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and my guys uh, at Sing Sing are so mindful that they've been thrown away, right? And that mostly people think they're monsters who belong in cages. Um, so I really wanted to kind of explore the idea that, we, that, there's, that there are these unnamed dead, right, that we don't account for. And also during our table work discussions for the play, one of the guys said, uh, the guy who's playing editor Webb, as we were, you know, sort of t- unpacking act three, he said, well, we're kind of like the dead, except because we're, we're sort of like Emily, except that the difference is eventually we're going to come home and we hopefully can make different choices. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I kind of wanted to like, uh, let all of those chords of meaning resonate together, right? right. Um, and, and so that married with this, how do we, how do we get from a, a stage set up for a church congregation to the cemetery? Um, well, the stage manager spoke the monologue, which is about three, or ha- three and a half or four pages long that sort of introduces us to Act 3 and to the death and the eternal and what is that essential thing in human beings that is eternal. Um, we did this, we built this kind of choreographed thing where very slowly, like this sort of kabuki slow 10 kind of thing, right? Where each of my dead men in his state greens would very slowly start to enter the playing space and would cross to one of those chairs from the wedding congregation and would pick it up in this very slow motion. And it turns out slightly painful <laughs> oh. um, just, just because they had to go so slow that if we rehearsed it more than once, you could see their muscles start to shake a little bit. Um, because I was asking them to go so slowly, right. um, but very slowly lift it in this arc up over their heads and then slowly lower it down into its new position for the cemetery and then turn and gently sink each man into his grave. Um, and then we had the name dead sort of follow them out as they got mentioned by the stage manager in that long monologue. So it, and I have to say it, it's, you know, it just started out as a, how do we solve this? And it turned out to be this incredibly beautiful piece of stagecraft um because they just kept coming yeah you know and at first uh when we performed it for the population last week uh there was a little laughter when those guys first started to move and it was a little bit like high school matinee kids laughing when they see their friends on stage um and it was a little bit of those guys look funny what are they doing and then it all of a sudden stopped like completely you know, it was as somebody had turned the volume down on the laughter. It just it, it all stopped when the first dead guy uh, actually turned and sat in his grave. And then that, in concert with what the stage manager was saying, people suddenly realized what they were looking at, which was that this cemetery was sort of growing in front of them, right? Right. Um, and the civilian audience got it a little bit faster. What they were, I think because they're more familiar with the play, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Our incarcerated audience was. Um, Uh, but it was, yeah. And then those, we, you know, what we talked about with all of the dead people was, you know, you don't just sit there and zone out for act three. These, all of these people are very busy and the stage manager tells us exactly what they're doing. They're, they're sifting through their lives, looking for that eternal thing and trying to decide what happened that was relevant and is eternal and what happened that they can release and let go. 
That's so, and, it, it's so fascinating. And one of the things you talked, you mentioned, is about maybe we can make different choices, which is certainly one of the seems to be a major theme of the play is of regret. Right. You you talked about that a little bit with the guys too about. We talked about that a lot. Yeah, I mean, because of course they wish they'd made different choices, or they wouldn't be doing a play inside a maximum security prison, right? Right. right. Um, and, and that was one of the reasons that I really lobbied for this play in this environment, because I felt like that was a really powerful message for them and for the population. You know, how do you live your life every, every moment when you're just wishing that 20 years would zoom by? Right. And I said to them one night, I said, not to be too morbid about it. I said, but none of us knows the day nor the hour, right? So if you're hoping that, you know, if you can just get through these 20 years, it's all going to be better. Like what happens if 20 years is all you got? You know, people die in that facility. People get killed in that facility from time to time. You, we don't know. Right. So don't wait because there's still beautiful sunsets out your window and there's still moments of lightness or laughter or kindness scattered among the, you know, the tedium and the cruelty. Um, so how do we cultivate the mindfulness to see those things? Um, and we talked a lot about the idea of, you know, if you could go back, so the day before you agreed to do the thing that eventually landed you in Sing Sing, if you could relive that day and not change anything about it, knowing that it was still going to end up with you being sentenced to whatever you've been sentenced to and convicted of whatever crime, would you do it? And they, you know, they were very vocal. Absolutely not. There's no, <laughs> no way they would go back and relive that last day of freedom if they couldn't change it because it would be excruciating to know where they were heading. Wow. Wow. That's, well, power of theater, baby. Yeah. That's it for this week's Reduced Shakespeare Company podcast. You can find out more about Kate Power's work by visiting her website, plainkate.com. And you can find out more about the Rehabilitation Through the Arts program through its website, rta-arts.com. Org. Send us your prison productions via email to feedback at reducedshakespeare.com. You can also post comments on many of our website pages, and you can post reviews of the podcast on iTunes. You can interact with other fans at our website at a Reduced Shakespeare Company Facebook fan page. You can also become a subscriber to our YouTube channel or become a twit. Follow us on Twitter at Reduced. You can find easy links to all these social networks at our website, reducedshakespeare.com. Thanks, as always, to webmaster Matt Rippey, stage manager Matt Matthew Croak, music by John Weber and Garage Band. Our random fan shout-out this week goes to Jane Richardson. No reason, it's just random. Special thanks to Howard Sherman, who turned me on to Kate Powers and her work. And thanks very much to you for listening. I'm Austin Titchener, 346 ten hundred and thirty eighths of the Reduced Shakespeare Company. How does your work in the prisons affect your work when you come out and work with theater pros? That's a good question. I think I am more patient. Yeah, those guys teach me a lot about patience. But of course, there are some flaky actors out in the world here and there, one or two. The actors who are, their need level is high, so we think. <laughs> and uh, these guys teach me a lot about how to be patient with that and how to um, communicate more mindfully and more effectively when I'm working on the outside. And um, are there one or two moments where you're working on the outside going, gosh, darn it, I wish I had those guys absolutely. From, from Sing Sing. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. This podcast is a production of the Reduce Shakespeare Company. Reducing expectations since 1981. Go to ReduceShakespeare.com for performance dates, actor bios, email newsletters, and so much less. And so much less. So much less. So much less. So much less. So much less.